Today, we're talking about a man named David, arguably the greatest king of Israel. David's name is first mentioned in the book of Ruth in, rela- in, re- in relation to his earlier forefathers. It was more discussed in the book of 1 Samuel and the book of 2 Samuel. It is also discussed, his life is discussed, in the book of 1 and 2 Kings, the book of 1 Chronicles, and 2 Chronicles, the book of Nehemiah, and even the major prophets and the minor prophets talk about him, whether that be Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, Amos, Micah, or Zechariah, we find David's words, or name rather, mentioned multiple times. We also find his name mentioned in all four of the Gospels, and finally, we see it all across the epistles, whether that be Acts, Romans, the book of Timothy, Hebrews, or even the book of Revelation itself. In short, the life of David is one of great robustness and a lot of history. But probably, the single most defining story of David is the story of David and Goliath. Even the secular world is familiar with this, and the term is often used in the secular world as David and Goliath moments. The reason why this story is so stunning is because it's a story of a shepherd boy who turned warrior and eventually became one of the greatest kings of Israel. As colorful as the life of David is, fact of the matter is, in much of his story, is a me- repeated moments of desperation. As such, I've entitled this message, The Struggle is Real. From the get-go of his life in his childhood, David suffered being the youngest of eight children with seven brothers. It says in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 11, when, so when, he asked, when, when Samuel asked Jesse when he was trying to find the king that God had led him to anoint, are these all your sons that you have? At this point, Jesse, the father of David, had paraded his seven sons, sans David. And then only then did he realize that he hadn't brought in his youngest son, whose name was David. And of course, Jesse had forgotten him and he was tending sheep. Some people say that it's possible that David was a bastard son. And Samuel said, we will not sit down until this child of yours arrives. The point being is, from the time of his childhood, he was not really destined to be a great person. In fact, he was probably rejected by his own brothers, as we will see in some of the stories of David. Secondly, he had a complex relationship with a man named Saul. Saul was to become the first king of Israel, and he would become his father-in-law. But because he became more popular than Saul, Saul eventually began to be jealous of him and envy him. In 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 8, Saul became angry because he kept hearing the refrain of a song that people credited David for the tens of thousands that he had killed, while he was only credited for thousands. And more than that, he, did, he began to, to have this idea that David wanted to take over his kingdom, which was not true. And from that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. It was a dire, desperate situation when this man wanted to actually kill David multiple times. The third thing that you will find that there are desperate moments in the story of David were his own adventures. As beautiful as the story of get, k- killing Goliath was, the following stories of war that David experienced were really dire. This first one was the fighting of the Philistines. He could never go home and rest with his own family because his father-in-law kept sending him out for battle so that at some point he was hoping he would die. For eight years of being chased around when he wouldn't die because of the wars he fought, his own father-in-law chased him around for eight long years. He found himself threatened by the very men, by his own men when, they, when his own families were kidnapped by their enemies and he was stuck in a cave with some of the most depressing people you can find in your life. His adventures were also dire situations. Finally, he was betrayed by the people of Kela, Ahithophel, and even his two children staged a coup against him. But more than just his betrayals, David sinned against God, and those were desperate moments when his passivity towards his children resulted in one of his sons raping one of his daughters, adultery that led to murder, and finally the taking of a census that would cause a lot of people, thousands of people, to die in his own kingdom. This is the story of David, the desperate moments from his beginnings, his relationships, his own adventures, his betrayals, his sins, and his own desperation. As colorful as it is, there were desperate moments. The question is, how did David overcome this desperation to become one of the major characters of the Bible? The reason is because more than just the popularity of David when he killed David and Goliath, David is known for the Psalms that he's written. 
The book of Psalms is arguably one of the most popular books in the Bible. For centuries, and many of them were written by David, and for centuries it been, has been the go-to book of many believers because it gives us the vocabulary to have a good dialogue where expressing our emotions to God. In Psalm 34, verse 6, it says, In my desperation, there it is, David himself confessing that there were desperate moments, a number of desperate moments in his, best, in his life and that the best person to go to was to pray to God. Why? Because God knows how to listen. And not just that he knows how to listen, he's the one who can actually save us from our troubles. Before I engage you and explain to you the various things or my three points for this message, I want to give you a short mnemonic in understanding your emotions. Our emotions are very similar to a smoke detector. Smoke detectors are incapable of extinguishing fires. And this, your feelings are very similar to a smoke detector. Our, our feelings are incapable of extinguishing the causes of why we feel a certain way, but they're there to alert us so that we can make sense of what is causing these things to happen. Emotions are necessary because when you feel something, then you would like to address the thing that you had. Our problem very often is, instead of treating our emotions like smoke detectors, we end up checking it regularly and trying to see why our emotions are not extinguishing the fire. We keep adjusting our emotions, thinking that by adjusting our smoke detectors, we will extinguish the fire. For some, it's even worse than that. We end up nursing the smoke detector, thinking that by doing so, the fires will go away. Others start calibrating it more and more, thinking by doing so, it will change the situation of the fire where the smoke is coming from. Our emotions are like that. They're there and designed by God simply to alert us that there's fire going on somewhere. It could be a small fire like a piece of toast that's burning, and it could be something of spiritual in nature, maybe a sin, the magnitude of which varies from person to person. But the point is not to focus on the smoke detector, but on the fire. It may be a relational issue that's causing the fire and why our emotions are the way they are. It may be a physical issue or something that we should have been dealing with in reference to our health and our physical bodies, but we're not willing to address. Instead, we keep tweaking our emotions. Or finally, it could be a financial need that's causing us to respond the way we do with our emotions. When fire comes, it usually could be a small piece of bread like this one, or it could be a serious thing like a fire like this one. And when we don't address the cause of the smoke, what tends to happen is it can end up burning the whole house. If not addressed properly, the smoke detector can be burned out together with the entire house. This is the danger when we don't know how to process and handle our emotions. The secret of the book of Psalms, particularly David himself, was David knew exactly where to bring his emotions. We know that sometimes when we give our emotions to people, it is an absolute waste of time in the get-go. Why? We end up triggering their own emotions and we end up tripping them with our own emotions. David knew that before you express your emotions to someone, go to God with your emotions. Why? God knows us from the inside out. When we fully express ourselves to God, we can be candid, we can be angry, we can be mad, we can be happy, we can be joyful because we know that God is able to help us process our emotions. Why? He knows us from the inside out. David in the book of Psalms 139 verses 1 and 2 says, You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know me when I sit, when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. In other words, you already know how I think, how I react, how I feel, and the consequences of my feelings. You already know that, and that's why you're not even alerted to a problem when I express them to you. You discern my going in and my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. You already know the way I respond to things emotionally. Before an actual word, an emotional setback that I'm about to proclaim is out of my tongue, you already know it completely. David understood this fundamental truth about God is the best person to go to for our emotions. Further in Psalm 38 verses 9 and 10, it says, All my longings lie open before you. My sighings, my emotions are not hidden from you. David knew where to bring his emotions. And God knows us from the inside out, which is why he is the best person to bring our emotions to. Second, God is available 24-7. 
David knew that while some people may not be available for us to express our emotions, God is. In Psalms 139 verse 7, he says, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide my emotions. Your right hand will stabilize my mental and my emotional well-being. David knew where to bring his emotions. God knows us from the inside out. God's available 24-7. And most people, when you express your, uh, uh, your emotions to them, you end up dis- discouraging them, throwing them off, or confusing them, or derailing them. And that's why you go to God, because God can handle even your worst rants and complaints. In Psalm 139, verses 17 and 18, David expresses, How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I'm still with you. Now notice how he's appealing to God. He's praising God. He's acknowledging the goodness of God. And right after that, in verse 19 and 20, he begins to rant. If only you, God, would slay the wicked. Away from me, you bloodthirsty. They speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. I not only hate those who hate you, Lord, I abhor those who are in rebellion against you. I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them as my enemies. This is a rant that if you did this to people, you might discourage them, confuse them, derail them, or even get them angry. And then he goes on to say in verses 23 and 24, Search me, God. Know my heart. Test my anxious emotions. See if there's an offensive way in me and lead me to the right way to process my mental and emotional well-being. When we express our rants, our emotions, our positive and negative emotions to people, in many cases, we might end up hurting them. But with God, we we are designed to go to Him. David knew this on, on an internal level. Despite the desperate situations he faced, he knew the person to go to was God because he knows us from the inside out that God's available 24-7, and God can handle whatever rant we have. Point number two is David knew how to express his emotions. He didn't just know where to go for his emotions, with his emotions rather, but he knew how to express it. His joys and excitement, he expressed it to God. He would express it in Psalm 32 verse 11 and other places of the book of Psalms. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing, all of you who are upright in heart. This is an expression of joys. This is an expression of victory, of excitement. You make known to me the path of life. You fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. The Psalms is a way to express our dialogue with God in our relationship with Him. It gives us a vocabulary not just for the joys and the excitements, but also for our fears and our sadness. David knew how to express his fears and his sadness. Psalm 38 verses 9 and 10 says, All my longings lie before you, my Lord, or Lord, my sighings, there is it, is not hidden from you. My heart pounds, speaking about his fear, and my strength fails me, and even the light has gone from my eyes. He's expressing his fears, his sadness, his deep issues. And then he says, When I'm afraid, I put my trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust, and I'm, and not, and I'm not afraid. What can mere man do for me? When I'm afraid, God, I put my trust in you. The ability to express our emotions to God is a very important facet of our faith. God, whose word I praise, in God I trust and I'm not afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? David knew how to express his emotions. David knew how to go to God. And David knew how to express his fears and sadness. Finally, David knew how to express his frustrations and his anger. Now, this psalm is not from David, but from a man named Asaph. However, it is worthy of mentioning because it still captures the essence of fear, sadness, and most of all, his frustration and anger. Psalm 73, verses 2 and 3 said, But as for me, my feet almost slipped. I'd nearly lost my foothold. (laughs) He's talking about how he's almost stumbled. And why? My emotions of envy of the arrogant. Because I almost slipped, I almost fell. 
because I envy the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. When we see people who are not supposed to be prospering, prospering, we become envious and our emotions need to be expressed not to other people or to the people we envy, but to God. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They're free from common human burdens. They're not plagued by human ills. Their pride is their necklace. They're clothed themselves with violence. From their callous hearts comes iniquity. Their evil imaginations have no limits. The psalmist, in this particular case, Asaph, and even David, knew how to express their emotions. His joy, his excitement, his fears and his sadness, their frustrations and their anger. My final point in point number three is David knew that ultimately God will restore his emotions. He knew that only God can satisfy. Now, it's not clear whether this psalm is actually from David. Some people believe this is a psalm that was written by Moses himself. Psalm 91 verse 15 says, He will call on me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. This is a psalm referring to God's response to someone who has learned to go to God with his emotions, who has learned to go to God with his fears. Psalm 91 verse 1 begins with a declaration that I want to go to you and hide in you because I'm afraid. And he says that if you do that, you will call on him and he will answer you. And when you're in trouble, he will deliver you and not just deliver you, but actually honor you. And with long life, he will satisfy you and show him your salvation, his salvation. David knew that God will restore his emotions. And he knew that only God could fully satisfy our emotions. He also knew that it was just a matter of time. In Psalms 31, verses 14 and 15, David expresses, But I trust in you, Lord. I say you are my God. There is David proclaiming that not only is my satisfaction in you, that it's just a matter of time because my times are in your hands. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies, from those who pursue me. And lastly, David knew that God will restore his emotions, that knew only God could fully satisfy him. He knew that it was just a matter of time before God did it. And finally, he refused to settle for anything less than God and his best. Psalm verse, chapter 40, verse 1 says, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. David said, I waited patiently for the Lord. Because I know at some point he's going to turn to me and hear my cry, and he will lift me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and the mire. In other words, the depressive moments, the hard moments, the places where I am distraught and desperate, he will lift me up from that in due time. More than that, he will set my feet on a rock, and he will give me a firm place to stand. David knew that only God could restore his emotions. He knew that only God can satisfy. He knew it's just a matter of time and he refused to settle for anything less than the best that God had to offer. The struggle of our emotions is real, but God through his Psalms and through the life of David tells us that if we know what to do with it and know that to bring our emotions, not just to one another, which by the way, is not a bad thing, but before you even do that, take your emotions to God first. Because God knows you from the inside out, and He will explain to you how to process those emotions. God's available 24-7, so when no one's available, He is. And thirdly, God can handle all your rants, whether it be about your spouse, your children, your boss, whoever it is, go to God. David knew how to express his emotions. He expressed his joys and excitements, his fears and his sadness, and even his frustrations and his anger. And finally, David knew God will restore his emotions, that only God can fully satisfy, that he knew it just a matter of time every time he went to God, and finally, he refused to settle for anything less than the best that God has for him. Join me in a short proclamation of the Word of God as we pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you that you are restoring our emotions, that you are the God who knows us inside out, you're available 24-7. Lord, thank you that you can handle all our rants and that you know, and, and Lord, that you're teaching us, teach us how to express our emotions, whether they be victories and joys and excitements, whether they be fa fears and sadness or frustrations and anger or whatever it may be, God, or even envy. 
teach us to express them to you. To know, Lord, that you will restore it and satisfy it fully, it's just a matter of time. And Lord, we refuse to settle for anything less than your best. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen.